Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Second time I'm filming this. I just sat down for half an hour, literally 30 minutes talking. I was going to edit it down, but it was a while. And I turned the camera off and realised that the microphone was switched off. And when you got the microphone plugged in and it's switched off, you don't have any sound. <laughs> so I've just sat talking to myself for 30 minutes for no reason. So I'm going to be repeating myself, which is lovely. Uh, for you, it's the first time hearing it. <laughs> so I just got home back. I just got home from Dubai yesterday morning. Hello. Uh, the trip went well. Um, we were doing weld inspections on a platform that had been bent in. Basically, a, sh a vessel had hit, smashed into it in bad weather, and this whole thing is just bent, like literally from the top to the bottom. So we were doing inspection work basically from the top to the bottom. The deepest dive I did was 45 meters. It's really on the edge of, of the limit that we can do on air. We can do 50 meters max. Uh, so 45 is pretty, you know, pretty deep for, for air diving. You get narc to that depth, which is a term for nitrogen narcosis. It basically impairs your thinking. Your, your brain slows down. <laughs> Uh, you can get confused, you can be forgetful, uh, you work slower, you think you're normal, you think you're fine, but you're just moving slower, you're not really there, you're kind of on another planet, but you you, you think you're okay, but you're just gone. <laughs> the supervisor can see it, and other people can see it, but you can't. Um, it's, it's a strange thing, um, but it is what it is. Uh, not all the dives were that deep, but a few of them were. And basically what we were doing was we were marking up the welds with a crayon in like clock positions and going around with a pointer stick and describing all the weld defects that you could see. So like pitting or undercut or stop starts or things of that nature. Just describing all the defects in the welds. And then after that we would use a probe scan device, it's called ACFM, Alternate Current Field Measurement, and you drag the probe around the weld in three different places across the toes and the cap of the weld and it, it looks for cracks basically so we're doing this kind of inspection work for the last two weeks narrowly escaped mixed gas diving it was on the cards and then we ended up not doing it thank god uh, it's not something I like doing particularly tool bag and stuff is here I've not unpacked yet I've got my diving knife and rescue line that's what my diving knife looks like And my magnet, this keeps me in position. It's got a an epoxy coating to stop it rusting and a nice handle to be able to lift it back off. So this clips onto your harness. Smack that onto the leg of the of the whatever you're working on and that'll hold you there while you work. You can't use that when you're doing ACFM because the magnetic uh, messes with the with the readings. So if you need to, you can use a hogging line so you have climbing carabiners mounted onto you with this ascender and your rope that you wrap around what you want to work on and you put the rope through there lock on and you hang off the rope this has got a breakaway a carabiner that snaps if the vessel loses position and buggers off uh, you won't die by being ripped apart this will snap before your umbilical does or before your body does uh, speaking of, of, of losing position, uh, that actually happened. There was a diver in the water. I was on deck feeding the, the water jet down. Um, I think we just, we'd just we recovered the water jet, actually. It was just inspection gear on the, on the downline. But the, the, the ship lost two thrusters in a massive engine failure, or, or a, a big power failure. Two thrusters went down. We lost position. We had a red light come on. That's so you, you, you get an audio uh, kind of signal and a red light flashes that we have a red warning light that comes on and that's okay the ship's lost position get the diver back immediately um, so a little bit of panic there we got the diver back quickly safely the vessel managed to hold its position it actually didn't run off even though it lost two thrusters but we stopped diving for the day until they figured out what the problem was and repaired it 
but that's a dangerous situation for a diver if the vessel goes and you're in the middle of a platform very dangerous you can you can get very quickly screwed so you have to always uh, manage your umbilical the the cord that connects you to your life basically you you make sure that's straight back to the basket straight back to the vessel that you that if you have to go you go um but that happened which was uh, not good and speaking of umbilical <laughs> uh man um i basically one of my dives was a deep dive 45 meters but the excursion that you pull your umbilical through what you need and it's color coded to certain depths this particular dive needed a, a long excursion there i think there was something like 25 or 28 meter it was a lot of umbilical anyway in the water so you pull all that through and you swim off to your work and you and I was water jetting with a high pressure water jet so two meter long steel gun cleaning the welds uh, for the inspection work and somehow I don't think it was my fault I, I can't see how it would be my fault although I should have tested my umbilical more um, to make sure it was straight but I was diving at night in strong tide and the current was going towards the vessel and because we were deep um, basically you you have a short bottom time it's like 20 minutes and you have to you have to get back to the basket and to the surface in a certain amount of time to get inside the decompression chamber where you're pressed down to 50 foot and you stay there for 15 minutes then you slide to 40 foot another 15 minutes and then you can come out you to get the bubbles out of your blood so you, you don't die <laughs> basically it's important that you 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 do that in a certain amount of time it's, it's dangerous if you if you if you don't so what had happened was my umbilical there was that much in the water as i swam across the tide had pushed it under or behind the basket and the wires of the clump weight See the basket, you come down a little basket that's, that has two guide wires with a, a really heavy clump weight that hanging off the bottom to keep it still. And the, the basket had stopped here, there was all this wire below the basket with the clump weight. The umbilical had floated in past these wires and basket and gone behind it. So, um, basically, when, when they started pulling up the umbilical, it... It entangled itself around the wires of the clump weight in the basket, creating this confusing looking knot basically around the wires in the cage. That's obviously a massive screw up. <laughs> so I got back to the basket and I was like, uh, <laughs> the supervisor was shitting himself uh, because he, he knows I have to be in a decompression chamber very, very shortly and I'm looking at a a huge knot and I'm narked when you have nitrogen narcosis you can't think quickly um, you just can't uh, <laughs> it's, it's I've never been drunk but people compare it to that it's like trying to solve a problem while you're drunk you you know that's um, not that easy I've never been drunk because I don't drink alcohol but that's the the best way I can compare it to even though I've never had that experience but believe me you're you're impaired so I'm looking at it going what how, how did it happen I don't understand what, what how, okay and now I need to fix it the, the the supervisor's stressing out I can hear in the comms he's getting the standby ready the standby sh shitting himself because he has to come and rescue me and he doesn't know how much of a mess it is and and I'm I'm cool as a cucumber, but I was totally fine. Um, I, I don't panic. There's no you 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 don't fix anything panicking. And when you're narked anyway, you're just on another planet. So that helps <laughs> as much as it it didn't help. But I was pulling this umbilical and going through it and kind of dragging myself around the cage. Anyway, I got in and untangled it and clipped myself on and they, they came up on it they didn't have to jump the, st the standby was ready to go he was in the basket about to come down and then i managed to sort it out and i got back in just by chance i mean i was off on my i was in another planet 
didn't know really what the fucking hell I was doing. I was I just managed to do it somehow, luckily. Um, I mean, it wasn't that bad. I just it's when you're narked, you just you your logic kind of goes, so it it becomes a mess. But I I fixed it, and it was fine. We we didn't run over the time, luckily. Um, so I, I just had the normal amount of time in the decompression chamber, so everything was fine, but it was a big fuck up, <laughs> and uh, I've never ever had that happen ever on any of my dives, so um, everyone on the ship knew about it, it was a little bit embarrassing, because if you feel like it's your fault, even though it's not really my fault, it's just there was too much umbilical, and the tide pushed it under, and then when it came up, it, 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 it just created a screw up. So we had a meeting afterwards and discussed, okay, how do we stop this happening in future? Because obviously not good. So what we came up with was not to have this giant gap where we have the basket here and the clump weight meters and meters below here, which uh, can allow for the umbilical to get caught around it. So we brought the clump weight right up sitting just under the basket. So it's, it's you know, uh, not not going to produce as big of a problem and then we did more live tendering so instead of having this massive slack in the water that can create a screw up we were only feeding the amount that we need rather than having the full excursion out so it, it didn't happen again we learned from it i guess so no you know anyway it was uh stressful even though i was quite they were making jokes about how cool and like calm I was and how like not normal it was to be that calm and chill. So that's good. At least, you know, the supervisor knows I don't panic. <laughs> but um yeah, it was an interesting trip anyway. We had a really good laugh on this trip. Um it was quite a funny trip. We were joking around. One of the other divers is also called Peter. And he had a dive, he, he's usually like a perfect diver, everything he does is is meticulous, he knows what he's doing, he's very well organised. You know, the, there's uh, kind of jokes that he's called the legend, because uh, he's just flawless. And um, But this, this particular dive, he was diving really deep, like he was totally knocked. And he had to clean this uh, case on uh, with Marine Grove to take some UT readings, some inspection readings to measure the thickness of the metal. Anyway, this marine growth was really thick, really, really hard, and all he'd taken was a tiny little scraper, and we told him, two people told him, take an axe with you to, to chop the, the marine growth that's gonna be hard. And he said, no, I don't need an axe, and just took this little scraper. He got down there, and he's scraping like crazy, he used all his dive up, didn't take a single reading with the inspection, didn't, you know, he didn't even manage to clear the patches off properly. This whole dive was a waste of time. <laughs> but what, what was funny was um, we told him to take an axe and he said, no, I don't need an axe. And then he got down there and he needed an axe. So we were kind of taking a piss as you do. You know, we just joke around and um, we made a song about it. Uh, and we wrote some lyrics about how he needs an axe and how he wishes he had an axe and, and recorded a sing-song in the room and, <laughs> and then when I got back I just edited it up and, and sent it on WhatsApp to the divers and then they got they posted it on Facebook and tagged all the other divers and all the supervisors and the OCM and everyone's seen it I think it's hilarious it's funny um, but that that was fun I, it's just teasing we, nothing nothing hurtful it's just joking around but it was funny though I'll put the that clip in at the end of this video you, you I'm the one playing guitar obviously and you'll see the guys that I work with or some of the guys that I work with uh, they're all my friends um, but that was funny I'll put the clip in at the end if you want to have a, a laugh about that <laughs> I took some perfume with me uh, Le Air de Desert Cane and the Rose de Kandahar I bought that one blind never smelled it before I don't really like it um, to be honest uh, Although it's got real Afghan rose in, I think that it's probably blended with a, a dose of synthetic artificial rose on top of it to, to bulk it out. It, it ruins it for me. And there's um, a powdery sweetness there. 
it's just not my cup of tea that one. And look, there's a desert Marocaine, which I which I do like. It smells great. This got tons of compliments. Everyone that I showed this to on the vessel loved it. Uh, like four or five guys there actually want to buy a full bottle of it. They said that they would wear that themselves. They really liked it a lot. I was actually surprised at the reaction from people because literally everyone I showed it to really liked it. I'm not talking like it's all right. I mean, they really liked it a lot. People were taking the name down and asking where they could buy it from. Um, this is, I mean, this could be a massive compliment getter. I, I never appreciated quite how mass appealing it seems to be. Um, I was taken back actually, just how popular this thing seems to be. Every, everyone loved it. I wasn't gonna buy any full bottles this year and I got tempted like you do. Uh, after reviewing White Vetiver by Abel, I went and bought myself a full bottle. I got a discount. Anyone can get a discount. You sign up to the newsletter and I think it was 15% off. So I got it a bit cheaper, which is good because, I mean, the price is fair anyway, to be honest, but a little bit helps. I've been wearing it every day for two weeks. You can see I put a dint in it there. I was spraying generously five to six sprays of this one. Um, but it smells great. Um, you have the lime and vetiver basically are the main notes. All the guys liked this one as well. No bad comments. And they definitely smelled it on me. Up to about, I would say, two hours after the fragrance, pe people could still smell it um, like away from me. Like I walked past people and they said, oh, I can smell you. Because they know I'm into fragrances and stuff. So they actually made comments on that. And so it's good because it, it felt like it was close when I reviewed it. I didn't feel like it projected that much, but although it feels like that way, people seem to smell it. Um, I mean, there is a fan blowing where we work offshore in the bit that we're working in. There's a fan that's blowing air constantly. So I guess that's, you know, it floats it around more, but people noticed it, people liked it. No one disliked that one, but the tower was the most popular. No one liked Unrose de Kandahar when I was there. Um, a few people said it smelled like an old woman. Not my opinion, but other, you know, the other divers said that. Uh, more news is that before I left, I did some videos on oud. I, I told you I was buying Exion Liao Ling, which is a wild oud from Papua. It's 13 years aged. It smells wonderful. It's earthy. It's like dry desert sand, it's it's intense, it's, it's a beautiful oud. I was going to blend a perfume with it, had a very specific idea to utilise it in a f specific concept. A week after telling you what I'd bought to make a perfume with, someone has bought the entire stock of it. And I bought that one because I knew there was a lot of it. Um, I actually calculated that if I was to buy three gram bottles I could buy up to $200,000 worth of this stuff. So obviously, you can scale that back. Um, you know, if you bought it in bigger containers rather than, you know, the three gram V vials, obviously it's going to be cheaper. And when you buy in bulk, it's going to be cheaper. But I mean, seriously, it's like it's still a hundred grams worth. So an investor, basically, some kind of invest, oud investor has bought a hundred thousand dollars worth of this oud and there's none left now for anybody else. I'm a little bit pissed about it, to be honest. I was like, what? So that that screwed me over really big time. I, that fragrance, it's gonna be ridiculously limited. I can only make a small batch and it's gone. I can't r replace that, That's that was a unique oud. Um, so, I'm hoping it's just coincidence that that got sold out and maybe it's nothing to do with my video, but the timing is suspicious. It was a, literally a week after I, I told everyone what I was going to use and then it, it was all gone. So I'm, I'm a bit heartbroken that, that I can't use it. Well, I can use it, but it's just not going to last very long. So what I've done is I bought 15 grams of a different variety of oud this I'm not going to tell you what it is because <laughs> But it's complimentary. It's not the same. It's 
but it's the closest one that I felt that complements the one that I've now lost. So I'm going to combine these in a formula together to stretch it further. So, and once that's, one, I'm not going to buy any more of this one. Once that, because I don't want to dilute the, the original one down too much. Do you know what I mean? I've got 15 grams of that one. Sorry, my nose is itching from that rose, the Kandahar. I want to sneeze. Oh. So I have 15 grams of this one, which I'm not going to tell you the name of it. And 15 grams of the other one. So I've got 30 grams of it to play with. Whatever that makes, I don't know how many bottles it's going to make yet. That'll be it. That fragrance is done. Which is a shame because um, I've been working on it and I really like how it's going. And it's a little bit sad. I thought in the future, once that's gone, the original batch, I might be able to redo it later at some point as a version 2. Call it 2, you know. And use different variety of oud in there to to make a different version of it but yeah that's the trouble with using artisanal oud uh, you know every distillation is unique and there's only so much of it and then it's gone so it's not a long-term thing these uh, whatever I use this high quality oil in is is gonna be limited at some point it's gonna run out so but I would rather make something beautiful and have it short-lived than not use it at all so that's the way it's going to go. I'm not going to tell you now which oils I select <laughs> for my perfume because I don't want someone to go and buy the whole thing again. I mean, that's ridiculous, isn't it? 100 grand's worth of oud. I bought a book on philosophy. It's kind of philosophical. Ph philosophical? That's not right, is it? Philosophical. Philo philo what the How do you pronounce it? Philosophical. No. Give me a second. Philosophical, there we go. It's kind of philosophical. It's called the Tao Te Ching, the Book of the Way. I'll read you a first passage. So the first one I'm going to read is called Opposites. When beauty is only a masquerade, it is simply ugliness. In the same way, goodness, if it is not sincere, is not really goodness. Existence and non-existence are incompatible. The difficult and the easy are mutually opposed. The long and the short, the high and the low, the loud and the soft, the before and the after are all opposites. Each reveals the other. The wise are not conspicuous in their actions or given too much talking. When troubles arise, they are not irritated. They produce but do not hoard. They act but expect no praise. They build, but do not dwell therein. And because they do not dwell therein, they never depart. Uh, the next one on the following page is called Restraint. When a ruler is silent on the subject of virtue, the people are discouraged from practicing it. Meanwhile, a ruler who revels in riches encourages thievery. Value virtue over wealth and the people's hearts will be at rest. Wise rulers do not accumulate treasures, but seek to quiet the hearts of their people. They soothe the people's appetites and strengthen their bones. They treasure innocence and protect the simple from the schemes of the clever. When a ruler practices restraint, everything will be in peace. I thought this was just an interesting book with, you know, kind of some philosophical kind of passages here. They're all fairly short, just one page. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, check it out. I only, I've only just started reading it today because it arrived while I was away. Oh, one more thing. Uh, if I get chance, I'm going to be going to Pitti in Florence, Italy, to the Fragrance Fair this year in September, if I'm not offshore diving. Obviously, I can't turn down work. If I have work then, then I can't go. If I'm not working, I will be going. I know a few reviewers are going. I'm not going to drop any names because I don't know if they've told anyone yet. But expect some good content in September. There's not just me that's planning on going. A few people are going to go. It will be cool if we can all go. Uh, looking forward to that. If I can go, I hope I can. It would be nice to see how it all works and to discover some new brands. Hey guys, I just finished the video and said goodbye, went to edit the video and 
after editing realised I'd completely forgotten to talk about uh, the airport smelling stuff in duty free so, <laughs> so I'll, I'll just talk about that for a little bit I smelled the new Dior Privé collection uh, they have a new line there's loads in there, uh, there's a lot, a lot of new ones I think they've done too many to be honest, I think they could have probably refined just a smaller group of them and made them really excellent but it feels like there's too many for me um, but I smelled all of them the one that I found probably the most interesting was called Sakura it's a floral fragrance but it's unisex it was just a bit different from the opening in the mid it was just, I, I'd not, I can't compare it to anything um, probably didn't excite me enough to want to buy it, but I would certainly review it. I thought it was at least one I would recommend to check out from the line. Another one I thought was good for, for a woman was called Happy Hour. I don't like the dry down, if I'm honest. But the, the opening in the mid was lovely, and I thought it would work really well on a woman. It very, very feminine though. I, most men would not want to wear this. But I don't like the dry down. The dry down has this kind of sweet musk. And the other one was called Rose Gypsy. It smelled kind of like a watery, transparent, light rose in the opening. It had a little bit more character as it developed. Uh, again, feminine. It didn't excite me to the point that I would rave about it, but I thought it, were, it was alright. I would, you know, if a woman wore that, I would think she smells pretty or, you know, I'd give them a compliment. So those ones I would recommend for women to check out. I did try Purple Oud and I was intrigued by the top notes. It was a little spicy, almost leathery, uh, obviously very woody, and but it lost my interest. I sprayed that on my hand as well as Sakura and I was bored of it after 20 minutes. I, I can still smell it on the paper two days later. To me, it didn't really come across as oud, it feels more like a woody accord. I thought I could smell things like cedar and guyac wood and definitely vetiver. I think it uses a combination of woods to, to create an oud kind of vibe, but it doesn't really, doesn't really work for me. It's just kind of this mixture of, mixture of woods, uh, but it just, it just lost my interest. It was a bit dull in the, in the dry down. Uh, when, when I was sat at the bar with uh, one of the other divers was also flying to, to the same airport as me so we were on the same flight and we, we were sat at the bar, he bought me a coke, I don't drink alcohol but he was having a pint and there was a, a girl behind the bar in Dubai and I picked up some samples to show my friend uh, one was Tuscan leather, obviously being my favourite he smelled it and his reaction was oh, like he, he thought it was gross he really didn't like it, he got the girl behind the bar to smell it and her face was <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> oh, big motorbike. I, I wish I'd have filmed her reaction, it, she hated it, she thought it was disgusting. Her face literally went Ugh, like that and said she, she actually said it smelled like um, an Arabic man. Ah, that's not my words, that's what she said. Uh, she thought it was um, smelled Arabic. Right. She said it smelled smoky and, and, and just too strong. She really didn't like it. But my friend, my other, you know, the diver friend also had the same opinion. He said it was smoky, tobacco-y, um, leathery. He didn't like it. No one, I, I get the most negative comments from Tuscan leather in my collection. You know, if we're talking about most complimented, Tuscan leather is my most not complimented. <laughs> A lot of people really don't like it. Two fragrances I tried in the airport as well were by Guilan and one was called Santal Royale which really disappointed me because the first hit I got was synthetic sandalwood uh, a molecule called Sandalore and that's all I could smell that hit me like in the face I mean there's other things going on but it's using your synthetic sandalwood to create you know uh, the accord there which is disappointing when it's called Santal Royale and it's in a pretty bottle you would hope that it would be a good dose of genuine sandalwood but it, the, what you smell is synthetic sandalwood 
but the price was cheap to be fair look I took a picture of it on my phone and it was a hundred and three pounds for a hundred and twenty five mil so for the price it fair play but it was disappointing nevertheless Ambra Eternal um, I smelled that as well the same collection and that had a synthetic Oris which I also own called Oris Jivco very powdery Oris they'd mixed it I think with pepper from memory but yeah it was mixed with spices and this Oris synthetic Th those were disappointing when such obvious synthetics are used as the main bulk of, of what you can smell that's always disappointing for me to recognize molecules like that in such big doses so the new collection from the Dior I smelled all of them I was disappointed the most by the Santal one I forget the name Santal Noir something like that uh, the one that's based around sandalwood and rose I was hoping because the notes sounded good I was really hoping that it would be pure in the sandalwood and the rose and it would smell wonderful because that in my imagination smells really good but there's this dollop of sweetness on it which just ruined it for me I, I didn't enjoy it at all it, it was a disappointment for me personally it just wasn't what I was hoping for I, 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 the dollop of sweetness over it just took away the character of the rose and the sandalwood for me which was a shame I didn't like any of the original collection of the private line in fact really there's not really anything by Dior that I like personally <laughs> And again with the new line nothing I would buy personally but if I had to recommend ones that were generally more appealing to me I would say these four uh, maybe I would say give purple Ood a try but for me it was disappointing I mean taste is ridiculously subjective once person loves something another person hates it another person is just not bothered uh, it's, it's just it's, you know it's that's how it is new videos very soon We'll get back into it. See you soon. Bye-bye.